So uh, welcome to the actually very last part of uh, Software Architecture and Stream from OP Conference. And it is my, my pleasure and honor to welcome Linda Rising. Uh, so Linda, do you want to say a few words about yourself and, and what you're working on? Sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to be a part of this conference. It's a struggle we know for all of us to attend one more Zoom meeting. So I'm grateful that people have thought that it was worthwhile to attend a keynote or hear what I have to say. So my name is Linda Rising. I live very close to Nashville, Tennessee. That is called Music City in the United States. And even in these challenging times, we have a lot of music in Nashville. And I am part of that because in addition to being uh, interested in software development, I'm also a musician and I direct several musical groups that are still going. Uh, so that's that's great. And, and we just spent some time uh, talking about that. Uh, so so um, that's yeah, that's that's very, very nice. Uh, what you're also known for is uh, fearless change. So so what is that? Fearless Change is a book that was published in the year 2005. That's a long time ago for any kind of technical or business book, and it is still selling. There was also a follow-on book, More Fearless Change. It came out in 2015. So if you do the math, you can see that there was a 10-year gap between those mm. two books. And what you can't see is the 10 year period before that first book. Each one of those books took my co-author, Mary Lynn Manns and me 10 years. So the two of us together have spent 20 years looking at how you introduce new ideas. How do you get people to listen to you? How do you get people to pay attention to your ideas? what kinds of techniques are valuable. And to do that, we use the vehicle of patterns. So these are patterns for helping people introduce new idea into organizations. And that's pretty much what the two of us have been spending the last 20, almost now 30 years producing these two books. So it's basically your your knowledge and your experience summed up. So so it's uh, it's it's certainly a, a valuable tool. There's also a game about it, right? Yes, and we were lucky enough. We met Deborah Pruce along the way, and in the year 2011, she attended a conference on games. She got together with several people at that conference, and they invented or created a game based on the patterns in Fearless Change. Their game is called Fearless Journey, and you can go to their website, Fearless Journey, and look at the cards, how the game is played. They have done more, I think, to advertise the patterns in Fearless Change than any other person except for Mary Lynn Manns and me. I have played the game, it's interesting, it's fun, and it's different. It's not what I would have thought of as a way to introduce these patterns, but it's very effective. Yeah, and uh, so there is the website, I think it's uh, fearlessjourney.info and uh, we'll, we'll put the, um, the link to it in, in the show notes. And also there are the cards uh, yeah. and I still have them with me. So, so I think you gave them to me as when, when I was doing that, that workshop uh, that you gave at, at uh, Joe conference, I don't know when. Um, yeah. so, and, and you can download them from the website, right? So there is on each yes. of the cards, there is, there is, um, there is one of the patterns and uh, the pattern. And, and you had us uh, think about how you can apply each of those patterns to, to a specific challenge that we had, right? I think that that's yes. what we did in, in the tutorial. Yes, exactly. So we didn't create those cards. I think a couple of other people who were interested in the patterns found that having the cards, each card having a different pattern helped them 
to work with the patterns, make a plan for the patterns, remember the patterns. Just there's something about a real card. A lot of this reminds me of the research in the 80s that Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham did when they were talking about CRC cards for object-oriented design. And they said, watching people with the cards led them to understand that the card became the object. And people who were the designers gathered around a table, moved the cards around, looked at the interactions between the objects and the cards enabled them to treat those software objects as real. Mm. They could pick up the card and move it around. So that's a human thing. We like real objects. We like to pick it up. That's why, yes, ebooks are fine, audio books are fine, but there's something about holding a book, turning a page. The research is clear. We do a better job of learning in a situation where we have a real object. Right. So those cards, I think, are, are very useful. Right. Um, so it is something that we could play around with. And, and the, you just spoke about a CIC card. So that's, that's a good one. Uh, those are the cards where you where with class, right? Where you say this is the class of the object, and then the R is for responsibilities and collaborations and with other with other classes, yes. right? And yes. um, maybe something that that I could pick up from it, and it's a good idea, is uh, you could do the same thing with bounded context from from domain driven design. You could basically there are domain driven design. Uh, on a context canvas, so you could do something similar where you would lay out the, the bound yes. context and, and play around with them. Yes. And you could do yes. it with, with Miro, right, these days, uh, as we are all locked in. Yep, yeah. yeah. exactly. We like real things. And so when you have those cards and you find you can pick them up and move them around, it enables your thinking about the idea, the pattern, the object, whatever it is, it makes it real. And then when you move it around, you can even see interactions, how patterns or objects would work together. It just gives your brain a framework for better thinking. Right. So, um, but one thing that I'm wondering is, uh, so, so you said that, that you're working on uh, sort of uh, changing organizations for quite a long time. So I'm more like a software architect and a software architecture consultant, I would say. So why would I care about fearless change? How is that tool useful for me? Because I mostly work on software, right? I don't yeah. work on organizations. Yeah. So I used to believe exactly what you're saying. I can identify with that that I've considered myself a technical person, mostly an architect or designer. And when I started working with Mary Lynn Manns, I thought the book would be technical. I thought it would be about technical solutions. What's a good way to organize the content mm -hmm. so that people can understand patterns and work with them. And I, took so much time to realize finally that no matter what your job is, no matter what part you play on a team or in an organization, you are really a salesperson. You are selling your ideas, you're selling your competency, you're selling your expertise, and you're trying to convince other people that you're doing a good job, that you have good solutions for problems that come up. Mm -hmm. Everything you do is sales. I don't know if you're familiar with the author Dan Pink, but he wrote a book called Drive and several other books about how the brain makes decisions. And in one of them, he makes that statement. We are all in sales. We sell all day. And that's really what the organizational patterns are about. How do you sell 
your good ideas? How do you make sure that your ideas get the credence they deserve, that you are respected as mm. an expert? You do that with sales techniques. And that's really what these patterns are all about. I would not have said that 20 years ago. Mm. It took me 20 years to realize that that's the truth. It's a, it's a very good point. I mean, basically it says when, when you build an architecture and it's just on a piece of paper, it's just on a piece of paper and it, it doesn't do anything. So you have to sell it to people yeah. to actually adopt it. And, and I had a good, uh, I had a, I had a good uh, discussion with one of the uh, attendees of, of my, of my talk where basically I said, I can come up with a good architecture by myself quite quickly, but that doesn't solve the problem. And it seems that people are still uh, thinking that, you know, putting that architecture on a piece of paper, that's the job, but really it is about getting others on, on your side. Yes. And even if it's, if it's a wonderful idea, goodness, we know, is not convincing. Right. If goodness, if goodness were all that it took, then we wouldn't have so many bad ideas, not only political ideas, but technical ideas, many times bad ideas win the day and the good ideas lose. So goodness is not enough. Right. So if I look at the cards, it's actually quite a few of them. Uh, yeah. So do you have any like like a uh, favorite pattern or one pattern that that uh, you you want to explain a little bit about so to get an idea about what what these patterns are like and and uh, how they are useful? Okay, so my favorite pattern is do food. And it seems a little trivial that food is influential. But we are deeply hardwired to be more open to ideas, to listen to others when we are sharing food. There are even some languages like French where the word for friend, compagnon, mm -hmm. means someone with whom I break bread. So this is so deep in us. It is hardwired to trust, to listen, to care about anyone who is telling us a story about a good idea, if we are sharing food, if we're having a cup of coffee together or a glass of wine or a piece of cake or mm. bread. So sharing food is not just a good idea. There is now scientific evidence. There have been experiments that show people are more open to influence when they are eating. So, so of course, all patterns have downsides. If you use that too much, you can overdo it. In the United States, we have an enormous problem with obesity. And of course, now we are all on lockdown and most people are eating too much. Of course, there are side effects. Right. But if you use that prop, that pattern wisely, you can bring people to be more open to what you have to say. So do food is my favorite. And it basically, so you could do a brown bag session or something to present your new architecture. And here is here is the card. So you could sure. use that card and try to think about how you can use it for your architecture. And you can take the next card and think again and so on. So that's how, how this works. Um, yes. I want to, to sort of switch subjects a little bit because um, your, your keynote at OP was about yeah, maybe a different subject, but but we'll have to figure that out. So it was uh, about arguing that the the rational mind is just the rider of the much larger elephant. So that's that's a good metaphor with this large elephant, and there is this small rider on top of it. And uh, the rational mind is the rider of the emotional unconscious mind. 
Um, so and we, we should we should give credit to Jonathan Haidt okay. because it is his metaphor. So Jonathan Haidt said this is a good way of thinking about how the brain behaves. And then Chip and Dan Heath, who have together, they are two brothers, have written a number of very popular books. They used that. They adopted that metaphor in a book called Switch that sold an enormous number of copies. The Heath brothers seem to have a formula for doing that. And so it wasn't my idea. I just liked it. I have read those books and I thought this could be a helpful way to think about how the brain operates. And uh, are they psychologists or, or what is their, their profession? So, so where, where does yes, that... Jim Sorry, Jonathan Haidt is a researcher, a psychologist. He's a university professor. And Chip and Dan Heath are both professors as well at different universities. But they are more business oriented. So their applications that they talk about and the kinds of things they're interested in are more for business applications. Right. Um, so when when I do what what I do usually do, which is talk about architecture, uh, it's it's a discussion where you know th there is some some solution, and we talk about uh, the the challenges that this solution is supposed to to solve, and you know the the advantages and disadvantages of that specific architecture. So that's a perfectly rational discussion, isn't it? So how does that influence my my day-to-day uh, -day work? So you've never had an architectural discussion with someone who disagreed with your ideas or your analysis, who said, no, that benefit is not a benefit at all because we're not interested in the thing you just talked about. We care about something else. And so you had a disagreement about that rational analysis that's never happened to you yeah but again i mean what what you're saying it's uh, is it's a rational discussion right it's about how this benefit is not a ben it's in fact not a benefit and you know you can you can discuss it on on the rational uh, level so obviously i'm playing the devil's advocate here so that's clear but uh, oh, that's good yeah that's right. absolutely good absolutely so, good because it point it points out something very important which is we all, not just architects, but we all think we are rational. We believe that. We think we see reality, that we understand the situation, the problem, whatever is going on. We think we see that clearly and that our conclusions follow logically. We all believe that. If someone disagrees with us, well, then they are the ones who are irrational. Those people on the other side, whether it's politically or technically, those people who don't agree with us, who think that our ideas are not good, who don't understand our arguments, well, they are the ones who are irrational. So, and so, what you're saying is that they might be even they might be rational, or yeah, they might be rational after all. Even though I think that that they might be uh, thinking the wrong thing. Um, so, so yeah. is there some some kind of concrete thing that I should be doing in that situation where there seems to be this rational discussion about how what I propose? is a bad idea for some rational arguments. So should I, what should I do in that situation? Uh, maybe I, I realize that there is some kind of deadlock and I don't believe that this is actually a truly uh, sensible argument. So I believe that maybe I'm, I'm at the end of some rational discussion. So what shall I do now? How, 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 how can I make that, that knowledge that there is this elephant in the mind of all of us? How can I make that usable? 
So one thing I think you have to realize and is very difficult is to see that you only have a very small slice of a view of reality. You don't see everything and that you are biased. Mm -hmm. You take in a lot of information, but your elephant makes sure that the only kind of data you really listen to or hear is something you already agree with. That's called the confirmation bias. We can look at a lot of wide ranging information, but we will filter it. We will make sure that the only thing we pay attention to is what supports our point of view. So there have been so many experiments around that bias. The most famous has to do with two groups of people who disagree on an issue, and it could be anything, a technical issue, a political issue, a religious issue. And both groups are given a paper that has data from scientific experiments about the two points of view. So two groups disagree, read the same paper. And the people in both groups always say the same thing, which is this paper supports my point of view. Now, if they disagree and they read the same paper, how can they say that? And the answer is they only accept the information that supports them. The other information, they either don't see it, they discard it, they overlook it, they denigrate it. Your brain will find a way mm -hmm. to throw out anything that you disagree with and only accept the information that supports what you believe. So, so you, ha you have to begin with that. You have to say that is how my brain operates. So when I deeply believe in something, my only hope is to talk to the other person who disagrees with me to say, Help me understand how you see the world because I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to talk to their elephant. So that means that in, in the situation that you that you just mentioned, I should probably try to take myself in, uh, how do you call it, in, in uh, their shoes and try to understand what, what their position is and, and yes. uh, try to, to sort of rationally uh, understand what they're thinking about and not uh, argue with them, but first try to, or maybe tr try to understand that position. Yes. Okay. So yes, that because you cannot, you cannot change other people. You cannot argue with other people if they deeply care. Of course, if, if you're trying to talk about a brand of toothpaste, yes, you could say, oh, this new toothpaste, is better, you should try it. Your old toothpaste is not doing a good job. Most people would be interested in that. But if it's something they really care about, an idea they have that they really believe is good, then they will not listen to facts. Mm -hmm. So you have to begin by saying, I don't agree with you. I don't understand this. Can you and we were talking early about Noam Chomsky. Can you help me be curious about that? And what you are doing is leading them to think, helping them think about their point of view or their solution or their idea. And in thinking about it and explaining it to you, sometimes they begin to realize Ah, I hadn't thought about that. Let me think about this. Not because you pointed it out, but because now they see it in explaining it 
and doing their thinking out loud with you. Right. And and another thing that, that I just noticed, because you, you said uh, that this problem arises in particular if, if you're already convinced about the solution. So what I, what I seem to be doing is uh, not try to think about a solution, but try to understand the problem at hand and try to, to understand what other people are suggesting as a solution so that I'm, so maybe that is some, do you think that is something that helps try to not be um, convinced about an architecture and a solution and try to sort of have your head clean and and try to think about the problem first, understand the problem, understand the other solutions that are proposed. Does that help? Yes, exactly. And in fact, it's a, one of the techniques that you can find in behavioral economics is to say, let me see if I can explain your idea to you. And if you can do it so well that the other person says, yes, you have explained it better than I could, then you'll know, aha, now I think I understand what you are thinking. Because mm -hmm. usually we go into the discussion believing that we understand the other side or the other point of view when we do not. Okay, so so that's maybe a, a, a very good point. So uh, Axel Hecht on YouTube just said, uh, objectively, objectivity is totally subjective. So that's that's probably a good one. But <laughs> yeah, um, but what I really so you you mentioned Noam Chomsky and uh, I mean he is. He is impressive, right, because he started off as a linguist and did that basic research on computation ability. And I learned about him from, from in, in theoretical computer science. And nowadays he is a, I would say, political thinker or intellectual maybe. So, uh, and, and there was a question after your keynote uh, that Jutta was um, uh, forwarded me. Uh, and the question was, can you agree with Noam Chomsky to not try to convince people, but make them think? Yes. Um, so what do you think about that? I think it's, a, it's an interesting point. Yes, absolutely. Because when you disagree with someone, usually our first instinct is to argue. And we want to rationally show the other person how wrong they are oh, you, you don't agree with me because you don't understand. You obviously are missing some pieces of this solution. Let me explain it to you. And instead, Chomsky and others have said, we should go into those discussions with number one, curiosity. So, I'm not sure I understand your idea, but I'm curious. Can you help me understand what you're thinking? And what you're doing with that is leading the other person to think. Because now they must answer your curiosity. Let me see if I can help you. Let me see if I can make it easier for you to understand mm -hmm. what I believe. And so they have to clarify their own thinking. Which, so Chomsky was exactly right. That's exactly what you want to do because when you make them think, now they must run through the idea, evaluate it, see it from a different point of view. Um, I'm not explaining this very well. Linda doesn't seem to understand. So I'll have to rethink it. And in doing that restructuring of their thinking, they can come to see the world differently. Yeah, not so because you told them, not because you argued with them, because they're doing it on their own to help you because you're curious. 
and it basically me i mean that's that's the other thing uh, if you if you're able to to explain something it means that you have really understood it so by asking them to explain it to you you make sure that they have actually understood it and they rethink and maybe under, see that they have haven't understood specific pieces and it's also even though that is really high level i see a lot of and it seems pretty abstract i have to admit that i see a lot of uh, connections to what I think I'm doing like asking questions trying to understand and not coming up with a solution but rather and that is why why I wanted to to have this uh, but make them think in in our conversation because that's actually what I want them to do I don't want to come up with a solution they should come up with their solution and they should property so and you know I, I can give some input like have you thought about that have you thought about that and what you said can you explain it to me and that way we get um, sort of to the next level and it's a different type of or a different way of doing architecture work I think and I, I think I think if we go back to the Greeks that's exactly what Socrates did he invented or created this way of leading people, not by arguing with them or outlining what the solution should be, but by asking good questions. And he knew, he knew where he wanted to go, but he wasn't explicit about it. He would ask a question to make the person who was listening to him think and in their thinking and reorganizing, they would come to a better understanding of what the problem was. So this is very old, this technique. It's thousands of years old. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, not too long ago, uh, I, did, I did an episode on uh, software architecture and stream uh, with my colleague Johannes Seitz about uh, Socrates and and his way of, of teaching people so um, it is something that uh, that uh, seems to be well how do you it, it's an idea that seems to be in the air and and several people seem to to think the same way and, and seem to apply the same principles I think I think too that if you look at how the brain operates when someone comes at you and they tell you they have a list of facts or they have a logical argument, then you immediately begin to resist and you want to fight back or argue against them. Where if somebody comes to you with a question, I wonder about this, or have you thought about that? Or I'm not sure I understand, or I'm curious about this. Can you, then now your brain, instead of fighting back is open to also wondering, oh, I wonder, I wonder how it is that maybe I can explain this better. Let me think about that. And so it is, as Chomsky said, you are making them think. Yeah, so maybe a sort of a, a good thing is to stay hungry, stay curious, what, what Steve Jobs, uh, I think, said at, at, at one point. And that is what, yes. what we should be doing. Um, yes. So we are even slightly over time. So is there anything else you want to add? Anything that, that I forgot to mention or to ask you? Anything that, that you want to say to, to the audience? I think we, we didn't talk about easier path uh, and it fits with the elephant metaphor because sometimes we are so focused on trying to convince people to do something or or um, adopt a certain idea when it may just be simply make it easy for them to do it. Make their lives easier if they do what you want them to do. And it, it, you don't care whether they actually believe in it or whether they're convinced that it's a good idea as long as they do it. And what the behavioral scientists tell us is once people behave in a certain way, then their beliefs follow later. So it's it's so it, moving. it's this idea of, of nudging, right? So trying to, to nudge yes. them in, in, a, in a certain direction. And, yes. uh, and, and, it's, and, it, and it can be that. simple, just a very simple thing. 
that makes it easier. The elephant doesn't want to walk uphill all day or stumble in potholes or trip over rocks. No, it should be a nice, easy, smooth downhill path with some peanuts. It's so easy. Why would you not want to do this? So maybe that's another thing for it. It should be easy to follow uh, the architecture and to follow the, the advice that you're giving and, and the ideas that you're making. Yeah. I'm just trying to find, I don't seem to be able to find the pattern, but that's about... Easier path was in, is in more fearless change. Oh, I see. So it's not, it's not in my cards. So that's, that's the reason why I can't find it. You'll have to make a new card. So there is my homework. Okay. Yeah. So, um, let me take a look at, at the chat still. Uh, probably also shows differences in nomenclatura and misunderstanding. So that's another good one that you can uh, see how we can, how we can sort of uh, clean up those misunderstandings when we talk to one another uh, and try to explain it. And that's, I think the last comment that I got. So I think we are, well, we are done. And as I said, we are slightly over time. So thanks a lot for spending the time with me uh, and uh, with Thank our you. audience and uh, giving us these uh, insights on, on fearless change and uh, the elephant. So thanks a lot and, and have a great day uh, over in, in the States. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.